Counting to God, Part 4. We've been going through the book Counting to God, Personal Journey Through Science to Belief, by Douglas L. You may remember as a graduate of MIT, um, and uh, uh, he... Uh, wrote this book as a, his personal story, but also as his personal foray into science. And it is up on the internet, and you can read it for free. The uh, front of the book looks like that. And uh, some of you will notice that the background uh, that I have to the slides has uh, been taken from that. We're going to go through part two. We've been going through part one before, and now he's going to talk about the science of belief. We're in chapter seven, which is creation. And he asked the question, why does anything exist? And that's what our discussion for today will be. He has two quotes, and uh, the first one is, of course, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the next is it all started with the Big Bang, which is apparently in the introduction to the Big Bang Theory, a popular television show on CBS. I will have to confess I've never seen the show, so I haven't heard how it starts, but that's what I am told. Um, and he starts out with a paragraph that kind of uh, summarizes what he's going to be doing in this entire section. Modern science supports the existence of God in seven ways. Science indicates our universe was created. It has not always existed. To me, evidence of the creation of the universe is the first wonder of modern science, the first of seven in our count to God. Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson had a problem. They were trying to measure radiation from our galaxy, the Milky Way. The two physicists working for Bell Laboratories in New Jersey in 1965 had obtained a, an extremely sensitive microwave antenna. The antenna was 20 feet long and shaped like a large horn of plenty. It was cooled by liquid helium to just 2.7 degrees Celsius above absolute zero so that it could detect extremely low temperature radiation. Penzias and Wilson wanted to measure galactic radiation with a wavelength of about 21 centimeters. To make sure the antenna was working properly, they first me measured radiation at a smaller wavelength of 7 centimeters. They expected to find no radiation at that wavelength, but there was radiation coming from somewhere. For several months, they tried to eliminate the noise. They chased away pigeons and cleaned droppings out of the antenna, which helped a little. I'm not sure how these pigeons were doing with uh, uh, liquid helium cooled uh, antennas, but uh, we'll let that pass. But noise remained. In addition, this was particularly strange, and this was particularly strange. The noise, this unknown radiation, was coming from everywhere. It was not affected by Earth's atmosphere, it was not coming from any source on Earth. And it was not coming from the Milky Way or any other particular stellar object or area. It did not vary as Earth rotated or as the seasons passed. There was no known scientific explanation for radiation at that frequency. Even more puzzling, in the history of science up to then, no one had ever observed radiation coming from all directions. Radiation always had a source, a point or region of, em of emission. Sometimes radiation was observed to reflect off an object or a surface, like light from a mirror, but it had never been found to come equally from all directions. There was no known scientific explanation for radiation that could come from everywhere at once. What could it be? Penzias eventually posed that question to Robert Dick of Princeton. Just a year just a year before, Dick predicted that there should be radiation left over from the birth of the universe, and he proposed an experiment to detect it. Dick was sitting in his office with colleagues when uh, Penzias called. It is reported that when the call was over, Dick said, Well, boys, we've been scooped. 
Ultimately, all agreed this unwanted, irritating noise was the greatest prize of all. By the way, there's an interesting story behind that. I, those of you who find it interesting enough are urged to look at the book and the, and the notes. Um, it was a signal, a relic from the creation of the universe. It is now called cosmic microwave background radiation. The photons that make up this radiation are called relic photons. These photons witness the birth of the universe. They have been traveling to us for 14 billion years. Well, to be precise, about 360,000 years after the birth of the universe, but basically, yeah. Penzias and Wilson accidentally discovered the scientific equivalent of the Holy Grail, verifiable proof that our universe began in a single moment. They were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1978. It may be the most amazing accidental scientific discovery of all time. There's other evidence of creation, some of which is described briefly later in this chapter, and today it is uniformly accepted that our universe had a beginning. But with the accidental discovery of relic photons by Penzias and Wilson, a profound scientific and philosophical debate that had raged for thousands of years began to come to an end. Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, believed the universe was infinite and eternal, limitless in size, and it always existed. His paradigm continued for well over 2,000 years. It continued through Galileo and Co Copernicus, through Newton and many other great scientists. These later geniuses altered the paradigm that Earth is the center of the universe, but not the paradigm that the universe is infinite and has always existed. For centuries, the strongest dissent came from the followers of Abraham, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. The Hebrew Bible begins in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. To the followers of Abraham, the universe was created. Albert Einstein originally believed in an eternal universe. After 1915, when Einstein proposed his general theory of relativity, other scientists pointed out that his equations suggested a universe in motion, either expanding or collapsing. Einstein did not want to accept that. To accommodate the prevailing scientific view at the time uh, that the universe was eternal, he fudged his equations. He added a, quote, cosmological constant, end quote, to keep the universe in balance. Einstein later called this cosmological constant the biggest mistake of his life. In 1914, the American astronomer Vesto Slipher discovered that almost all of the fuzzy objects in the sky were moving away from us now. If you're reading this, he's not defining what fuzzy objects are. They're called nebulae, and just it means the Latin for cloud, which is basically fuzzy object. That most of the time you have stars, but some of the time you have these blobs. He was able to measure their movement by studying the light they gave off. The light was notice notably weaker at certain frequencies corresponding to known atomic absorption lines. For example, the simplest element, hydrogen, with just one electron has an absorption line. There's a bunch of other ones too, but this is the big one at a wavelength of 656 nanometers. That's a billionth of a meter. Called the H-alpha line. In the light from stars, these photons are typically absorbed when a hydrogen electron changes energy levels. For almost all of these fuzzy objects, the frequency of the H-alpha and other absorption lines was shifted slightly. The absorption lines appeared at a lower frequency, which means a longer wavelength, than what would be measured in a laboratory on Earth. For each fuzzy object, the absorption lines were shifted, meaning the waves, uh, light waves were stretched by similar proportions, although we'll find out that, that they actually varied even more than that. To a scientist, the stretching of wavelengths has a clear meaning. It means that the fuzzy objects, whatever they are, are moving away from us fast. This is a Doppler effect. When a siren is coming towards it, we hear a higher pitch than when it is moving away, just as an example. 
Movement of the source toward us compresses the sound waves and increases their frequency or pitch, and movement away stretches out the sound waves and reduces their frequency or pitch. So these are being reduced, so they must be going away from us. I'm skipping a little bit faster. It's interesting, but uh, you can understand without it. In the 1920s, Edwin Hubble realized that those fudge objects were not just gas clouds. He discovered that they contained billions of stars. They were entire galaxies like our own Milky Way. It was curious that almost all of these massive collections of billions of stars, our Milky Way galaxies believed to have 200 to 400 billion stars, were moving away from us, receding, at very high speeds, typically hundreds of miles per second. What could cause that? One of the great challenges facing astronomers over the past 100 years has been the calculation of distances in space. How far away are the stars and these other galaxies, these other island universes? For nearby stars, as Earth revolves around the sun, a wobble can be detected and measured. As the nearby stars appear to shift, a nearby star appears to shift in position compared to more distant stars. This is a cute trick, but it obviously does not work for distant objects, and it certainly does not hold for far-off galaxies. A variety of techniques were invented and applied. A key breakthrough was the discovery that for certain variable stars, stars that varied in brightness in a fixed way, like clockwork, every three days, one could determine their intrinsic brightness. Their intrinsic brightness depended on the period of the oscillation, oscillation of their light. So when one of these unusual stars was found, one of these standard candles, that is, uh, they knew what the frequency is, so they knew what the absolute brightness was. Astronomers could measure how bright it appeared on Earth and estimate its distance. These unusual pulsating stars are called Cepheid variables. They, f they have 5 to 20 times the mass of our sun and are up to 30,000 times as bright. Over 700 Cepheid variables have been, been identified in our Milky Way, and they have been detected in galaxies up to 100 million light years away. The closest one, by the way, is the star Polaris, North Star which is about 300 light years away, and that can actually be measured by parallax as well. Hubble and others found some of these variable stars, these standard candles, in what they now knew were far off separate galaxies. By 1929, Hubble had estimated the distance to 24 nearby galaxies. He created a graph with distance from the Earth on the horizontal axis and speed away from Earth, as measured by the change in frequency or redshift of the light, on the vertical axis. For each of these 24 galaxies, he marked their distance uh, divided by speed as a point on the graph. The result is the famous graph on the next page, which I will now show you. And you can see there's some variability, and there are even a few galaxies that are coming towards us that are close enough. But as you get further out, um, the further out you get, the more dependable it is that they're going away and the faster they're going away. And, uh, you know, you can do a uh, mathematical calculation as to where the line should be. I'm not sure I can tell you what the difference between these two lines is, but I can tell you that it's not very much. Hubble discovered that, distance, that the distance away from us was generally proportional to the redshift or the speed away from us. In other words, galaxies twice as far away as others are moving away from us almost twice as fast. Galaxies four times further away are moving away about four times as fast, and so on. This astonishing relationship between distance and receding velocity is generally true throughout the entire universe. It is now called Hubble's Law. Hubble's law has religious implications. If you imagine the universe billions of years earlier, 
that is, you play the movie of time backwards so that all the galaxies are coming together, it suggests the universe began in a single moment of creation. Uh, and in fact, uh, Hawking and one of his colleagues, that's Stephen Hawking, proved that if they get close enough, they all do go back to the same point. It's not a matter of they could just make a near miss and then expand as you go backwards. Um, Hubble's law suggests if you reverse time, all the galaxies might collide at about the same time in the distant path, past. Because galaxies twice as far away as others would then be heading back twice as fast, if we imagine the time going backward, they could all collide at or about the same time in about the same place in the distant past. Hubble's law suggested that the universe had a beginning, that the universe was created, as claimed by the faiths of Abraham. The original estimate of when creation took place was between 10 and 20 billion years ago. In Hubble's law, science took an important step toward supporting a religious belief and rejecting prior beliefs in an eternal universe. Einstein visited Hubble after his discovery and said, I now see the necessity for a beginning. Hubble's discovery sparked disbelief, sarcasm, and controversy. One famous and then atheist astronomer, later changed his mind, Fred Hoyle, mockingly referred to the implied concept of creation as the Big Bang Theory. The name stuck. Despite Hubble's evidence, a competing theory called the Steady State Theory was widely accepted. As, it named, as its name suggests, according to the Steady State Theory, the universe remained remains relatively constant. To explain away Hubble's findings, it was claimed that as the galaxies flew apart, new matter was created to maintain the same overall density of matter in large regions of space. Keep in mind that there was absolutely no scientific evidence that such new matter had ever been created. There was no scientific theory that allowed the creation of matter from nothing. In fact, a basic law of science, the first law of thermodynamics, is that the total amount of matter and energy in the universe remains constant. So it was bad science. Its sole purpose was to avoid the obvious philosophical and religious implications of the Big Bang. Its advocates started with a firm conviction that the universe was eternal and they desperately tried to invent an antidote to Hubble's law, even at the cost of violating basic principles of science. The 1965 discovery by Penzias and Wilson of background radiation from the Big Bang, relic photons emitted 14 billion years ago, killed the steady state theory. Well, that plus a couple of other things. Today, at the dawn, uh, this dawn of the third millennium, scientific evidence of creation is overwhelming. The spectrum of the radiation fits perfectly with the expected black body radiation from such an event. According to one scientist, it tells us that the universe was once so dense that it was a single continuous body in thermal equilibrium, one that could be characterized by a single temperature. At first, the radiation was thought to be too uniform, and an absolutely uniform background radiation could not explain how matter had condensed into galaxies. However, 1992 measurements revealed very slight variations on the order of one part in 100,000 that closely match scientific models of the formation of galaxies and galaxy clusters. Nuclear physicists have shown that the amount of certain elements, such as helium and deuterium, that is hydrogen with an extra neutron, closely match their calculations of what happened during the creation of the universe. Moving on, there is one other piece of strong scientific evidence that our universe was created. The last piece of scientific evidence is almost too simple. You can do the experiment yourself. You can actually detect strong evidence that our universe is not infinite and eternal. Go outside at night and look at the sky. Is it dark or is it as bright as the sun? And of course, if it were as bright as the sun, we would all be cooked. Why is the night sky dark? It's an ancient and profound question. A dark night sky is not consistent with an infinite and eternal universe. As Edgar Allan Poe stated, 
why he picked Edgar Allan Poe for this, I don't know. But I, I'm not aware that Poe was a, a great astronomer, but who knows. Were the succession of stars endless, then the background of the sky would present us a uniform luminosity, like that per displayed by the galaxy, since there could be absolutely no point in all that background at which would not exist a star. And you can actually prove this mathematically. In other words, if the universe were infinite and eternal, every line of sight would end on the surface of a star. It would be like he standing in the middle of a very large canopied forest. In all directions, one would see the trunk of a tree and nothing else. You can show this mathematically by thinking of Earth as surrounded by an endless succession of cosmic shells containing stars and galaxies. If the universe were infinite and eternal, which means there's enough time for light to get to you, and assuming that stars and galaxies continue throughout such a universe that is evenly populated with stars or roughly evenly part of populated with stars, then each shell would contribute roughly the same amount of light. As you consider more and more of these endless shells, the amount of light reaching the Earth grows until light is coming from every point in the sky. The riddle of the night sky has been called Olber's Paradox. Heinrich Wilhelm Olbers was an amateur German astronomer who described this apparent contradiction in 1823, but he was not the first to do so. The contradiction between the dark night sky and the concept of an infinite and eternal universe was noted by Johann Kepler in 1610, and maybe by others as well. Of course, Olbers' par paradox is not really a paradox. It is scientific confirmation a combination of logic and observation that our universe was created as claimed by the faiths of Abraham. The Big Bang created the entire universe in one magnific magnificent event. It created space and time and all matter and energy. It did not occur in a specific part of the universe. Rather, it occurred simultaneously everywhere in the universe. The universe began as a point. What we see from Earth, galaxies moving away from us in accordance with Hubble's law so that the farthest galaxies are moving away the fastest, is happening all over the universe. Space itself is expanding. One way to get a sense of how our three-dimensional space can be expanding everywhere in the universe is to go down one dimension and consider a two-dimensional surface. Now imagine this two-dimensional surface curved into itself like the surface of a balloon. And imagine the galaxies as dots on the surface of that balloon. As the balloon expands, all the dots move apart from each other, and the dots furthest away move the most. If a two-dimensional being on the surface of the balloon is not aware of the curvature of the surface of the balloon, his third dimension, then he observes his own version of Hubble's law as the balloon expands. The dots, or galaxies, twice as distant are receding, twice as fast. Our three-dimensional space is expanding in the same sort of way, moving apart everywhere. Religious belief in a universe that was created rather than a universe without a beginning has become accepted scientific theory. Time and space and all of the matter and energy that ever existed and ever will exist were created in a single instant from absolute nothingness an event that cannot and never will be explained by the natural laws of what now exists. If that is not scientific evidence of wonder, then I do not know what is. It all started with a Big Bang. And now, the first cause. What caused the Big Bang? What caused our universe to exist? In the sixth century of the Christian era, a group of Arab intellectuals argued that the universe had to have been created and that a created universe implied the existence of God. This argument is now known as the Kalam cosmological argument. The name Kalam comes from a tradition of Arab intellectuals. The argument goes like this. Anything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist Therefore, the universe has a cause. 
Part one above is philosophic. We'll discuss it below, but it is hard to deny. Part two above is the Big Bang, now the net accepted scientific theory of creation. Part three follows from part one and part two. Interestingly enough, there really isn't a challenge to part two from the scientific community. I mean, there are people who don't like the Big Bang, but they're, not, they're left with pretty much a similar problem. You either admit about something caused the universe to exist, or you have to believe things can begin to exist with absolutely no cause. Keep in mind, science has never found anything that begins to exist that does not have a cause. Things do not just pop into existence with no cause and no explanation. This has been true for all of human history. When you lock the door to your house, you do not expect to come back and find strange objects inside. And if you ever did encounter such an object, you would quickly look for a cause. We may not always know the cause of an event, but, if a, but a fundamental premise of science is that all events have causes, even if you can't see or directly detect them. Assuming that the, uni then that the universe had a cause, we are forced to accept that some being, something outside of our universe caused it to come into being. Something that does not exist in our reality created our reality. This is a fundamental tenet of the faiths of Abraham. It's also, in my view, an inescapable logical and scientific conclusion. Abraham's belief that something outside of our universe, our reality, caused our universe, reality, to come into being now follows from a simple combination of logic and scientific theory. We have not established that there is a God, and we certainly have not proved the God, that the God of the Bible exists, but we have established that there is something outside of our universe and that unknown something caused our universe to exist. This is an important start. Those who are somewhat familiar with quantum physics may object at this point. One feature of quantum physics is that field fluctuations can come into existence and then disappear. These are called virtual particles and they are believed to exist although generally for very short periods, such as a thousandth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, perhaps one might argue quantum fluctuations cause our universe to come into being. The clear flaw in this reasoning is that virtual particles do not come from nothing. Virtual particles come from a quantum field that permeates all of space and time, our entire universe. The quantum field is a high energy field, put another way, before you can have a virtual particle, you ha first have to create space and time. And the quantum field, as was done in the Big Bang. Prior to the Big Bang, space and time did not exist. And there was no quantum field. So quantum effects in our universe could not have caused the Big Bang because there was no time or space or quantum field before the Big Bang. To me, it's sort of like the joke when scientists are trying to convince God they can do anything God can do. Like what, ask God? Like create human beings, says the scientist. Show me, says God. Scientists say, well, we start with some dust, and then God interrupts, wait a second, get your own dust. <laughs> so if anyone wants to claim our universe popped out of a quantum field, they need to explain what caused the quantum field to exist. One of the basic tenets of scientism is that nothing can happen outside the laws of physics, that miracles cannot happen. The Big Bang is a clear contradiction. And so we come to the last stand of diehard atheists, the anti-faith side of the great debate. By now, you should not be surprised to learn that the, this atheist position is also today's accepted scientific paradigm. Well, at least by many. It is believed that there is some sort of universe-creating mechanism that somehow spews out an infinite number of universes with different physical constants. This infinite collection of universes is often called the multiverse. The existence of an infinite number of universes of a multiverse is necessary under this anti-faith appro approach to avoid two serious problems. If you want to, why infinite instead of just gazillions? Here's why. First, if there were only a finite number of other universes, then there must have been a first universe or set of first universes that came into being. 
What then was the first cause of the first universe or set of first universes? Only by believing in an infinite number of other universes, universes without number and without a beginning, can the anti-faith believer avoid the profound theological implications of a first cause. The second reason why the anti-faith side believes in an infinite number of universes is to avoid the amazing coincidences discussed in the next chapter. It is scientific fact that our universe is made exactly right, fine-tuned, so to speak, for life. We will see how the laws of nature appear to have been arranged and dozens of factors appear to have been exactly set so that life may exist. With different laws and even very slightly different settings of those laws, life could not possibly exist. One has to believe in an infinite number of universes with every possible sort of different natural laws and constants. Not only infinite, but infinitely varied. To explain away the apparent perfect design of our universe. One also has to believe that there is some unknown principle or area of physics that could generate universes with different laws and constants. So we basically come down to two possible explanations for the Big Bang. The first explanation proposed by the faiths of Abraham is that something outside of our reality created our universe. And I'm going to pull in this note just because it's, at least to me, interesting. Some scholars believe this concept traces back to at least the Babylonian captivity when parts of the books of Genesis may have been written. I think it's probably fair to say all scholars believe it at least traces back to the Babylonian captivity. Some scholars would put it much earlier. Um, the second explanation is that there is an unknown branch of physics of which, if one is intellectually honest, modern science does not have a clue, which somehow creates an infinite number of universes. You can choose to believe either one. Both require you to believe that something outside of our universe created our universe. In other words, both require you to believe in a greater reality. Scientific evidence of the Big Bang, the creation of space, time, matter, and energy from a single point, forces you to c confront the question of the first cause. The creation of the universe does not get one automatically to belief in God, but it does get you close. The Big Bang has turned the tables on those who doubt the existence of God. Originally, when the prevailing paradigm was that the universe was infinite and eternal, followers of the faiths of Abraham had an uphill argument. They had to argue that the universe was created and the first cause must have been God. Now the tables are turned. Religious belief in creation now fits squarely within the evidence of modern science and prevailing scientific theory. Creation implies a first cause, something outside of our universe that caused our universe to exist. Chapter 9 is entitled Problems with the Multiverse and describes to me why at least it is easier to believe in God than to believe in the multiverse. For now, let's just note that to explain away the scientific fact of creation and the amazing coincidences described in the next chapter, anti-faith adherents have to believe in three things. One, there is some unknown branch of physics, note we have no clue as to what it is, uh, capable of producing universes with laws and constants of physics, and varied ones at that. This unknown branch of physics has actually produced an infinite number of universes without beginning and without end. And somehow, three, all of this exists for no reason and without cause. That's what you've got to swallow. These three beliefs, which are not supported by scientific evidence, and in fact it's arguable th that they never can be, underlie the concept of a multiverse. To many who view existence as without meaning, these are reasonable beliefs, probably because the alternate concept of a creator is literally unthinkable. To many who embrace the Abrahamic faiths, the concept of a creator God is comfortable and natural. And these three beliefs are unnatural, perhaps comical. The paradigm clash is huge with a vast chasm between opposing sides of the great debate. 
Of course, a person can believe in the multiverse and still believe in the God of the Bible, and he gives a couple of examples. God could have created more than one universe, but I think most people who think the multiverse really exists are atheists. I do not fault those who choose to believe in the multiverse. I simply assert that belief in a creator God is at least equally reasonable. To me, it is now the anti-faith adherents who have the weak position, who argue against the evidence of modern science. And this is only the beginning. If the only scientific evidence for God were creation, then God would be viewed by some as only a name for the mystery of the Big Bang. As we will see, the hypothesis of God, the theory of a creator and designer, has six other scientific pillars of support. We have only begun to count to God. Now, uh, that finishes the chapter. I do like El's argumentation here. I would add one caution while we're doing it, and that is that the Big Bang is not actually proven. It is only what I would call a limiting scenario. That is, if you keep projecting everything back into the past, this is what you have to get. Uh, if the laws of the universe are extrapolated, we wind up with a point that rapidly expanded. That we can't extrapolate forever into the past. We reach a brick wall, so to speak, that you can't get through. If the laws changed, or if God created something partly formed, the universe could be younger than it appears. But of course, if the laws changed, then the laws are not binding on God. Um, but the important thing is, if we insist on no miracles, no changing of the laws of nature, we wind up with a maximal miracle at the beginning of the universe when the universe was created. So the position that there are no miracles actually is an untenable position. There's no getting around it. The universe was created by something outside the universe, which was either incredibly lucky or incredibly thorough, as in a multiverse, or incredibly intelligent. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, we have a comment here and over there. I was hesitant. I'm hesitant to say this, but I grew up believing that the un taking for granted that the universe is infinite because God is infinite. So, think mulling all this over while I've been hearing this is that who? How can we find out God? We do not understand His ways, and of course, I'm not taking. I mean, people like to have concrete. They have, they like to have something that they can trace, like this Big Bang thing. But I don't. <laughs> I'm thankful that I'm not restricted to that because I believe that God is far beyond our comprehension, and that He could do things that we can never, we could never, in even in the most brilliant mind here on Earth, imagine. Yeah. Well, I think that's right. I, I think the most important thing is that this is mm -hmm. the death knell of, yeah. a, of a pure scientific view of the universe. The laws of nature are all there is. God himself, if he exists, can't, can't reach through them, can't change them, can't work around them. Uh, this is just the way it is. And I don't see that there's any, that position founders on this fact. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to stay by causality as a, an argument, isn't that destroyed by the question, where did God come from? Who caused him? And I'm surprised he didn't touch that question here. Now, uh, granted, uh, the question of how God came about and the question of existence are two different questions. 
and uh, so on, but uh, one does have to face that uh, causality has a weakness there. Uh, as you keep going back with any idea of causality, you back, eventually you find it keep asking, you know, uh, what caused this and so on. Uh, you come to a point where causality no longer works. Well, actually, but, uh, though, um, if you notice the wording of the Kalam argument, it gets around that neatly. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. If God never began to exist, if he has always been there, then he does not need a cause. But that does not answer where God came from. Well, what it does is it says the question of where God came from is a category error. That's right. You, it, it's a, a little bit like asking how much does the number three weigh? It does not apply. See, God was always there, and so he doesn't need a cause to exist. He can be, um, if you want to put it that way, his own cause, because he's always been there. And I've seen people, I, the, the crazy part of it is that people who will argue this in defense of scientism, you know, where did God come from? Who made God? Um, will try to persuade us that the universe didn't need a cause to exist. Which is just crazy because they're implying that the universe didn't need a cause, but God did. And God, by most people's definitions, is eternal. And the standard scientific argument now is that the universe is not eternal and the one that needs a cause is the universe and not God. That's fine. Still, you can call it a category error, but you, are you not going to go into the category of where God came from? Uh, that question is still there. And I think causality falls apart there. Well, what that, all that does is, is to say that when you get to the first cause, you stop. And interestingly enough, Aristotle, who argued that the universe was eternal, still felt that it needed a cause. And that the first cause was... So there was a cause before the universe. There was a cause. So where did well, the, co the cause come from? Where, where did... The, what he says is that you either have an infinite chain that keeps going back and back, or you have a circular argument where something causes something else which causes it, which actually makes a little more sense. And I give you some examples of circular causality. Um, or you have a first cause. And Aristotle argued that philosophically, um, and he was arguing, I think, on weaker <laughs> premises than what we have now. I think the cause, for the, the the argument for Aristotle actually has increased, because he was arguing for an infinite universe, infinite in time, having a cause, a first cause, and whereas now we don't even have to argue for that. It's a finite universe, both in space and in time. Um, uh, or as we would now say, in space-time, that has a beginning. But you can still, you can still answer the question, where did your circular causality come from? Well, circular causality? Okay. Well, circular causality, I can give you uh, one example that, that I... Aristotle would not have thought of um, because his mechanics didn't allow this to happen. But you can have two planets orbiting each other. As they keep orbiting, 
one planet is the cause of the other planet's orbit, and the other planet is the cause of the first planet's orbit. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm more comfortable with thinking maybe I don't understand the whole idea, all the ideas of the universe and that. Uh, causality uh, does break down eventually and there's a reality beyond this. Well, and, and, and the, the question is do you break it down at a, a, multi, or, or at a universe producing machine or do you break it down at an intelligent God? And that's one of the things he's pointing out is the last refuge is the universe creating machine. And you have to ask the question, was that designed? If it was, then we have a designer and we're right back where we started from. Um, and, and that's a huge problem. We have a comment way back. Doesn't the statement say everything in the universe has a cause? No, everything that begins that uh, st uh, begins to be has a cause. Okay, but that's that's based on our experience in this universe. That's based on our, and I, it's probably fair to say our uniform and unexceptional experience within this universe, time and space. Within this universe. Et so since we're arguing that God is outside of this time and space, that's also a question. It gets back to your being eternal. That's, that's we're the basing other, that statement yeah. based on everything we can test within this universe. Yeah, that's the other flaw, is that if God created not only the material of the universe and the energy in the universe, or as science would now say, the matter energy of the universe, but also the space-time of the universe, then putting God into, he could have his own time. Uh, time could be totally irrelevant to him. Interestingly enough, when they describe quantum experiments that are not, and, and view it from a timeless perspective, they call it a, a God's eye view. And I'm not very familiar with the Big Bang Theory, but I thought there was a period of time after the initiation of the Big Bang in which the laws of physics did not apply and there was a more rapid expansion and then it, it changed. And when you made your statement about <laughs> that if God could have created more complete that it would have a different time scale. Well, as a matter of fact, you're correct. And the interesting thing is that it has echoes of the steady state theory. As he pointed out, the steady state theory was created basically to say we're nothing special and we don't need a God. And in order to do that, they violated uh, the law of conservation of energy, which is one of the cornerstones of modern physics. Um, and they violated by saying that in every meter, cubic meter of, uh, of space, there appears a new hydrogen atom, I forgot, every year or something like that. It's small enough that you would never be able to detect it. But it's large enough that it could eventually create new galaxies uh, that, that, um, uh, that somehow uh, fill in the spaces between the old galaxies. And the idea is that the universe would always look exactly the same in every direction, no matter not only where you look, but also when you look. Because 10 billion years ago, or 15 billion years ago, which is beyond what the Big Bang was supposed to have happened, uh, in fact, 
Um, if you had looked out, you would have seen galaxies pretty much like they are today. And that there, that there never was a Big Bang. That just what you see is mostly created stuff since then. And they did that for the specific reason of affirming, one, we're nothing special. Two, there's no such thing as a creator. Now, of course, once you propose to violate the first law of thermodynamics, then there is nothing to prevent an Earth from popping into view, let's say, 6,000 years ago. The idea that the laws of physics don't allow that is just bunkum. First law of thermodynamics works most of the time, but every once in a while something will pop in, you know, and if that's what the historical record says, then we just roll with the punches, right? Um, the, the point of it is that what is happening is people are exploring different ways of explaining everything without God. And the more they try, the more they leave open the possibility that God did exactly as has been described. You can't, and, and what it, uh, the other thing I think it does is it lays bare the theological motivation of these people. They don't want the Christian God. They'll take a deist God if they have to. Now with the universe being the way it is, they're getting pressured more and more into that kind of thing. Well, you know, he created the universe, but then he walked off and left it. He really doesn't care. As we will see as we go through, that deist perspective won't work either. And then once you've conceded that deism isn't good, that you have a God that's created life and may have an interest in it, then you, then you have to ask questions like, has he communicated with that light, life? And if so, do we need to listen to that? Because maybe he knows more than we do. And that starts getting really uncomfortable. But that's where we are. Science won't let you get out of it. Go ahead. I can't help but think about our public universities and how our young people are coming from universities. And if they've had no backdrop at all from home, can't help but think that people aren't thinking, that they're just, young people today are so um, caught up with life right now and what's happening on my Facebook page or whatever, um, that they just take it in. That they're not really thinking about deeper issues, they're just accepting what they hear a professor who knows more than they do. Well, uh, there's some truth to that, which means that the professors that do know more than they do have a certain solemn obligation to them. They do. And maybe if tragedy comes, then people think about these deeper things. Yeah, yeah. On occasion, when happy things come, people think about these deeper things. That's how Douglas L. had it. He has a baby. His wife says, well, let's take it to church. Ah, do I want to fight this? Nah, just give her what she wants, sure. You know, keep the oh, wife happy, right. everybody's happy yeah, kind of right. thing. And, yeah. uh, and then he starts, uh, you know. Thinking. They, these yeah. people have something. But how can that be with the science? And so then he goes... Well, then I'm going to need to look at the science. And then he runs into this thing, and he's stuck with, you know, scientism won't work. And then he'll say, and deism won't work. And about four chapters later. And after the book is written, he's starting to say, well, maybe old earth won't work either. He is, you think? Uh, or not just... in the book. 
Not yeah, in the book. But you know. But about he has that? he you know he's emailed to me. Saying that uh, there's some stuff that's pretty convincing out there for a short age, mm -hmm. for at least life on Earth. I, he, di he didn't detail exactly what it was, and so I, and I'm I'm asking him. I'd be very interested to hear what he has to say. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that you know God can reach everybody anyway, it, as long as they're willing to follow the evidence. He'll lead him as patiently as he needs to. I heard a pastor recently say. <clears throat> to parents whose children had gone their own way, turned their backs on God, and they were Christian parents. He said, you know, the verse in the Bible that says, train up a child in the way they should go. He said, I just want you to know, I've seen children 60, 70, 80 years old who have turned around and come back because they had something from way back when that suddenly made sense. And his encouragement was to parents to continue with, you know, being faithful in, in the early years of their children. Yeah. Um, well, I think that this is really important that you don't give up when it doesn't go your way within the next two minutes or even within the next month. Um, plant the seeds. Yeah, plant the seeds. Let God do the watering. When God tells you you should water now, you water now. But other than that, don't try to control them. Just, just uh, you know, act like a Christian toward them. And then uh, God will do whatever He needs to in His own time. And yes, there'll be 20 or 30 or maybe 50 or 80 years of wasted time in between. But it beats forever being wasted time. So just, you know, I think one of the things that we have is we tend to, tend to try to feel like we have to control the situation. And, you know, God didn't call us to be his attorneys. He called us to be his witnesses, which means, you know, our job is not necessarily to persuade the jury. Hey, if you can, fine, I don't have a problem. But, uh, but the, 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 strongest, the strongest attorney, frankly, is a witness who can say, and this is how it happened to me. This is what I found while I was doing science. Mm -hmm. And then simply tells the other person what's going on. And then, you know, they take it, they don't take it, whatever. Uh, that's not your job. And uh, if you read the beginning of Ezekiel, you'll find God talking to Ezekiel precisely that way. Your job is to be a watchman. You're going to be on the walls. They listen, fine. They don't listen, that's not your job. Your job is to, to witness to what you see. The same pastor said that, um, actually in, an, in another sermon, um, this is Alistair Begg, if anyone's interested, from Scotland. He lives in Ohio now, but he said, um, Jesus didn't say, well done, good and successful servants. He said, well done, good and faithful servants. And there was a big difference. Yeah. And you know, you might put your talents out and you might find them you might find them go down in price after the stock market crash, but he still doesn't want you to put it in a hole. Uh, you know, I think he expects us to invest wisely, but he expects us to invest. need to understand that some of these issues, some of these questions are simply artifacts of time. Because all of us are intuitively locked in time, we cannot intuitively relate to anything outside of time. 
we always think in terms of before something and after something. But when the universe began, time also began. Right. At that point, that's the singularity point. Not only space, but also time started. So it's totally meaningless to ask what happened before the universe. There is no before the before. There is no before there was time, because you cannot measure with time before there is time. That doesn't make any sense. You cannot logically think that way. You have to think in terms of things which transcend time, which are always there, uh, thus they can only be the ones that were there. Except for Walt Disney, who made the movie The Land Before Time. Yes. children think dinosaurs were before creation. That's what they tell me as nine-year-olds. Interesting, interesting. But are we sure that time did not exist before the universe existed? Well, um, if, um, what's his name, uh, Einstein was correct, and there's some pretty good evidence that he was, uh, then, then, then time did have a beginning, an absolute beginning. And that, you know, the mm -hmm. relative streams of time may, may, uh, not relate to each other in exactly the way we would normally think. But they all came back to a point in space-time, and that's it. Which means that if God wanted to create it in another way, there's nothing to prevent him from doing a space-time thing either. So I, I think that... Um, but if, if time varies... Uh, can't we think that maybe uh, it's not an absolute, the absolute we try and make it? Well, that's the point, is that if it had a beginning, then it's not an absolute in the, in the, in the ideal sense. There could be things that, that were happening uh, to mix metaphors outside of time. Anyway... Tomorrow we're going to talk about the fine-tuned, or not tomorrow, next week. We're going to talk about so the fine-tuned universe. So fine you want to universe. continue looking at, not only did the universe begin at a point if you project it backwards that far, but if you project it backwards that far, it's incredibly smooth. And if you want to know what inflation was invented for, it was specifically to get rid of a designer for that smoothness. So, we'll have some fun next week. <laughs>